Hi there, Finny. It's Papa again. Just wanted to read you a few more stories. And we've got that new book that came in the mail for you. So from the Pablo Public Library. So uh, <coughs> I want to read that for you, okay? So hope you're having fun in Germany, buddy. So here's that fly butterfly book that I told you about that came in the mail. Let's read that one together. It's called Fly and Butterfly. All right. So the wind blows softly, tickling the leaves of a milkweed plant. The air is sticky and sweet. It is summer. A butterfly flutters her wings. She is searching for something, a leaf, still moist from the recent rain, hidden at the bottom of the milkweed plant. Silently she lands. This is the perfect place. The perfect place to leave something special. The perfect place to lay an egg. The butterfly is going to lay an egg. The milkweed plants. Now, the butterfly has flown away. She has left her leg behind. The wind blows, scattering many green leaves. But the egg stays on the leaf of the milkweed plant. The egg is round, not a perfect circle, but round enough. With a hard shell to protect it. And there is a hole in the egg, a tiny hole, but just the same, a hole to let in air and water and sun. So the larva inside the egg can grow and grow and grow. There's the larva. <clears throat> now the larva has three pairs of legs and a jaw that is very strong. It is hungry. It eats its way out of the egg. The larva, which is now called a caterpillar, is free. And the sun hangs low in the sky. It is still summer. The caterpillar is hungry. It eats and eats and eats the leaves of the milkweed plant. The caterpillar gets bigger and sheds its skin. It's some more, it eats some more and gets even bigger and sheds its skin again and again and again. How it goes from gray, like that, to where it turns into this big thing. Eating, eating, eating that leaf. Now the caterpillar has enough to eat. So it looks for a place where it can be safe from birds and insects and the garden cat, like Rosie. Slowly, slowly, caterpillar crawls onto another branch of the milkweed plant. The caterpillar makes a pad of silk and hooks itself onto the pad. It hangs upside down from the branch, looking very much like a J. Can you guess what it's going to turn into? Okay, looking, 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 and then it sort of looks like a J, just like in my name, Yaro. The wind blows, scattering leaves, orange, red, and gold, and a bit of brown grass. It is now fall. The caterpillar sheds its skin one last time. The sun shines, <coughs> its rays bouncing off the caterpillar's jade green skin. The caterpillar, now called a chrysalis, hangs upside down from the branch. The chrysalis hangs on, t on tightly to the branch, and it is still, but only on the outside. Inside, the chrysalis, something is changing. A great, big, miraculous change. Gone is the caterpillar's body. Now there are wings. Orange and yellow and black. See that? Goes from the J. Sort of wrapping himself, wrap, 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 till he's a chrysalis. Look at that chrysalis. You can see the wings poking through there a little bit. It is time. The chrysalis cracks open. A butterfly emerges. But she is small and weak. She cannot fly yet. Her wings are tiny and crumpled and wet. She clings to the chrysalis as blood pumps through her body. The butterfly must wait until she's strong enough to fly. When the butterfly's wings get bigger, her body dries off. The wind blows softly, tickling the branch. 
The butterfly takes off and lands on top of a purple flower. Using her straw-like tongue, she takes a long, sweet drink from the flower's nectar. Now she starts out there, gets her on her way out, and she hangs on, hangs on, hangs on, and then stretches her wings. And look at that, how she can get, use her little nose to get down in there and get the nectar out of that flower. The air smells spicy and is damp. It is still fall. Soon it will be too cold for the butterfly with her delicate wings of orange and gold. So she flies, not alone, but with other butterflies, hundreds of butterflies for thousands of miles. Clouds of butterflies glide on wisps of wind. When the butterflies are tired, they stop to rest turning trees orange and yellow and black. Look at that. It's like a butterfly tree. That's pretty cool. <coughs> when they are 30, thirsty, they will stop to drink. Legs shimmer with the butterfly's reflections. Then they fly some more over green forests and silver cities. Pretty cool. They stop to sip nectar from flowers, and they feel strong, strong enough to fly over the mountains of the Sierra Madre Oriental. Look at that. Flying over mountains. At last, the butterfly can rest. She has made the journey to Mexico, and it is winter. But it is a kinder winter here. No harsh winds, no sleet, and no snow. The butterfly looks for a place, a safe place to rest and spend the winter. The butterfly finds a fir tree, but she is not alone. She is with other butterflies. They are all nestled in the branches and on the bark of the fir trees, safe. The butterfly sleeps. Sometimes she stirs or wakes up a bit, but mostly she rests, waiting for the winter to end. And now it is spring. It is time to wake up, time for the butterfly to fly home. She now she will begin her journey with other butterflies, but she will not fly all the way home. Look at that map. Flying across the states. From south all the way north. <clears throat> the butterfly flies north. She is searching for something, a leaf, still moist from the recent rain, hidden and at the bottom of the milkweed plant. Silently, she lands. This is the perfect place perfect place to leave something special. The perfect place to lay an egg. Now the butterfly is gone, but she is left behind an egg. And a new butterfly's life will begin. That's a nice story. Pretty cool. All right, and now we've got two more books to read. Awesome. This is also from the Eugene Public Library, so they send us these. So you get lots of cool posts, Finn. This one is One Cool Friend. Cool post, cool friend. Nice. I miss you, buddy. You're my friend. Your best friend. All right. Elliot was a very proper young man. So on Saturday morning, when his father said, Family fun day at the aquarium, shall we go? Elliot thought, kids, masses of noisy kids. But he only said, of course, thank you for inviting me. How very proper. At the aquarium, Elliot's father nest settled on a bench to read his National Geographic. Have some fun, Elliot, he said. So Elliot did. He skipped the mobs of kids at the giant saltwater tank. 
an amazing jelly just displayed and his hands-on type of exhibit. At the end of the hall, he discovered. Penguins! What? In their tidy black feather tuxedos with their proper posture, they reminded Elliot of himself. Even Ferdinand Magellan looked like his kind of guy. Ferdinand Magellan. That's funny. At noontime, Elliot's father asked, Are you having fun? Yes, thank you, said Elliot. May I please have a penguin? Sure, his father said, and handed him over a $20 bill. That's very kind, Elliot said, and headed off. Today's special, Plush Penguins, 1995. He's walking the other way. Hmm. Elliot emptied the school notices from his backpack and selected the smallest penguin and popped it inside. father asked, where's your penguin? In my backpack, Elliot said. Thanks for asking. In his room, Elliot dialed the air conditioning down to its coldest setting. Maybe you'd like to skate, Elliot asked. Grrr, said Magellan. He named his penguin Magellan. It's a famous explorer. So Elliot dragged his old wading pool upstairs and fed the garden hose through the kitchen window and turned on the faucet. Forgive the innocent inconvenience, he said as he passed his father's office. <coughs> Soon the air conditioner had done its work. Look at that. They're ice skating in his room. You need to do that. Later, Elliot knocked on the door of his father's office. I have some research to do at the library about Magellan. When I was in third grade, I got Captain Cook, his father said. Where did you keep him? Elliot asked. But his father had already returned to charting the changing boundaries of the Great Barrier Reef. Elliot and Magellan rode to the library. When Elliot set him on the librarian's desk, Magellan held completely still. Mrs. Stanbridge didn't blink an eye, even when Magellan blinked his. She helped them access www.penguinsonice.com, copy pages from Antarctic Antidotes, and borrow best behaviors for birds. On the way home, Elliot stopped for eight bags of ice and a snack. Luckily, his father's $20 bill was just enough to cover it. How did the research go? Elliot asked from behind an atlas. Great. Magellan was perfect, Elliot said. Just like Captain Cook, his father said. Elliot read his library book aloud while Magellan cooled down. They shared a bag of goldfish crackers, but Magellan was still hungry. May I please bake frozen pizzas for supper, Elliot asked. Well, that's nice of you, his father said, but the only flavor we have left is anchovy. Perfect, Elliot said. Magellan loves them. Anchovies are fish. That evening, Elliot heard his father rummaging for ice cream. Luckily, Magellan, Magellan had politely moved the carton to the front of the freezer shelf. Unfortunately, Magellan forgot his manners overnight. When Magellan awoke, he was long, longing for a swim. Elliot drew him a deep tub of cold water. He left Magellan diving and holding his breath. That's his bathtub. Look at that. Silly Magellan. I think I'll have a bit of a soak, Elliot's father announced. Wait, Elliot said. I left my penguin in there. 
I'll set him on the hamper and do my best not to splash. Elliot! Elliot rushed to the door. Young man, where did this penguin come from? Elliot's father demanded. The southern tip of Argentina. Argentina, blah. Elliot said. That's right, his father said. As for Captain Cook, he added, he came from the Galapagos Island. Ha! Captain Cook is a really big tortoise. Whoa. He wasn't mad that he got a penguin. Awesome. Well, that was a silly story. All right, one more, buddy, and then I'm guessing it's probably bedtime or time to go out and play in the pool. One of the two. So, the boy in number four. The ice rink locker room sat, oh, in the ice rink locker room sat the boy in number four, lacing up his skates like so many times before. He thought of all his practices, some early and some late. The drills he would do to help him. Pass, and shoot, and skate. There were times when it was easy, and others that were tough. But even when it seemed too hard, he would never give up. <coughs> <coughs> He'd sometimes get an injury, a broken bone, or a bruise. And though they did try hard to win, sometimes his team would lose. But the boy in number four had a passion and a dream to one day be a player on a big league hockey team. Passing, shooting, skating, his coaches led the way. and taught him to respect both teams when it came time to play. For months and months he practiced. Now the game was due to start. He skated out before the crowd, excitement in his heart. The whistle blows for the puck is dropped and off speeds number four. Passing, shooting, skating like so many times before. He sweeps around behind the net and up the ice he races. His skate blades flash from left to right in front of cheering faces. Another player passes. Now the puck is number fours. His eyes can see the net in front. He steadies. He shoots. He scores! It's a goal for number four. A game-winning goal for the amazing Bobby Orr, who is number four. The end. All right, buddy. Well, I miss you. I love you. And I hope you're having tons and tons of fun. I will see you after my trip in Belarus. I'll see you in Germany, okay? Love you. Tschüss. Good night. Ciao.